I'm here with Matthew Tennant. Matthew is a senior minister at the University Baptist Church in Charlottesville, Virginia. He serves on the Human Rights Commission for the city of Charlottesville and is a visiting professor of philosophy of religion at a university in Haiti that I'm not going to try to pronounce. I'll ask him to pronounce that later. <laughs> he um, has authored two books, including Preaching in Plenty and in Want and the work of the church treasurer. And he's also an active blogger at matthewtenet.org. But this is his new book, um, Crossing the Lines We Draw, Faithful Responses to a Polarized America. And so um, isn't that something that we all need to deal with? Uh, polarized America. So um, more, more on that in a moment. But Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. So please pronounce the university correctly. Since well, I can't. I'll do say the English. Uh, it's the Christian University of North Haiti. Ah, okay. And it was started by some missionaries about uh, 50, 60 years ago. And since the uh, Anglo missionaries who started it um, passed it on, uh, it, it has been completely operated and run by uh, Haitian uh, professors and, and academics. And the dean of the school there, Monel Jules, is the first person who I contacted uh, or, or contacted me. And, and I've been teaching there for about seven years. Uh, I go down about once a year. Unfortunately, this year, I haven't been able to go because uh, citizens from the U.S. are not necessarily welcome in many places right at the moment. We're a hotspot. We are indeed. That's So how did you, how did he reach out to you or how did you get involved in that? It was through a, a mutual uh, contact we had through the American Baptists, and um, I had just finished my PhD uh, in theology from the University of Oxford and was doing some uh, adjunct teaching locally. I lived in uh, somewhat rural Virginia on the Chesapeake Bay in a town called Kilmarnock, and I was serving as a minister at a church there. And um, as we began our email exchange, it's it was something that was uh, a real passion of mine to be able to, to share the, the world-class education I received in, in England with people who didn't have the opportunity to, to read and study some of the authors that I had. And, and so it, it, the interesting part about that experience is it was probably more formative for me than many of my students. I wrote to uh, Chris Rowland once to tell him uh, about the experience. And I said, you know, I think they're teaching me more than I'm teaching them. And he said, I just can't tell you how much that warms my heart that your theology is being formed in Haiti. I can totally believe that. You know, uh, I was lucky enough in my previous life to spend a lot of time overseas, not in a uh, religious context, but business context. And uh, eye opening experience, you know, mm -hmm. to see. Uh, the way the rest of the world lives in various ways. There's a, the Sapir Whorf hypothesis is, uh, talks about the way we think is formed by our language. And it's proven true in my own experience as I meet people from different cultures and, and see how the thought processes are formed differently in different cultures. And language is a big part of, the, a part of that. Um, but I'm really excited to talk to you today about uh, crossing the lines that we draw. Yeah, please tell me how did that book come across? Or how, it, how did it come apart? It, it came about in really in, it started in 2016 at, during the election season as I, I saw people sort of forming this, the, the tribes that was not new at that time. We've had a two party system, but there's always seemed to be this sense of being able to go play tennis after the Senate adjourns for the day. And as that election season kind of wore on, some of the, um, the language and, and the way that issues were framed really seemed to be this bifurcation of either or. There was no middle ground. There was nothing, no listening. And uh, it was some what after that in 2017, I, I came to Charlottesville to begin serving as the senior minister at University Baptist Church. And a few weeks after I arrived, the Unite the, White, the, Unite the Right rally uh, was here in Charlottesville. And um, 
it was such a stark moment here in the city. I was brand new, so I didn't have the, the emotional reaction that many people who love Charlottesville and um, have been here for many years had when they saw the white supremacists, neo-Nazis showing up and said, this isn't who we are. Over and over again, I heard that that's not who we are. And in the fall, I, I had the chance to, to go up to Cambridge, Massachusetts as a part of Baptist Move Global's Conversations That Matter initiative and uh, was in, in a group of ministers talking about this polarized moment. And it was, I, I decided to ride the train up for the, this conference at Harvard. And uh, it was on the train ride, I think coming back that I started to conceive of putting some of these thoughts together into kind of a toolkit, uh, a way of approaching these conversations. The, the funniest part, Ryan, was that by the time I wrote the manuscript in uh, 20, late 2018, um, maybe early 2019 is when I'd finished it and edited it and sent it off to uh, Judson to see if they were interested in publishing it. I kept thinking when I was distracted from writing and doing other things, ah, this moment's gonna pass. Everything's <laughs> gonna get better. And by the time it comes out, it'll be so stale. No one will be interested in hearing about reconciliation. And it's horrible that it's even more salient now than when, I first started thinking about trying to address this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that is really sad that it's got, gotten worse. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I feel the same way. I mean, your, your series, this, this series of videos is so important right now. And to think a few years ago, it just seemed like, okay, this is as bad as it's going to get. Surely, you know, by the time we get through the next cycle, the next elections, the next news cycle, things will normalize. And we're at a critical moment right now where not only have things, his life not normalized, but it's incredibly frightening. So tell us some things, you know, either from the book or from your experience sen since then, that you found to be most effective in um, speaking through this polarized divide. Yeah, I think that one of the most important components is the relationship. Uh, everything, we, we frame um, the question in terms of the big picture, speaking through the divide, through speaking in this polarized moment, but there's no vacuum into which we speak. When I tweet, I know that the majority of the recipients of, of, or readers of my tweets are people who have followed me. So they're looking for something like what I would say. And so that's not going to be how we end up speaking through the divide. It comes back to the individual relationships we have with people. And, the, and a great example of that is uh, someone with whom I was texting just a few minutes before our, uh, our chat this afternoon. Um, this is somebody who is uh, from a, a very different political perspective than my own. And um, I, it, it was a fruitful conversation. I brought up a, a recent news story. And I mean, the, the, the conversation began because my family just got a new puppy. And so we were talking about that and uh, he wanted to see a picture of the puppy. And, um, and, and then I mentioned a news story, but I tried to do it in a, in a disarming way um, and it almost because of our relationship, I was able to ask almost in a joking way. And then I, I even, I, I was concerned he may not take it that way, but he did take it in a humorous, you know, joking way. And we were able, he was able to respond. And then we went back to talking about pets. And, and that's not to say, don't have the difficult questions. Don't call somebody out when they're uh, saying something that's just wrong or abhorrent or, or not factual, but the way that we approach one another with empathy, uh, listening, uh, really trying to open ourselves to the possibility that we may not know all the answers. These tools can allow us to have conversations and then it's the conversations that can foster the relationship and that can give us an opportunity to have a voice to speak into the divide. So, um, you know, what, you've, what you're talking about is kind of an individual behavior. It, 
it, right? It, I mean, right. yeah, because the um, the uh, the policy or the the large scale behavior um, is to some extent limited to those people who have have the voice. So if um, the president, if President Trump were to come forward and say something that was uncharacteristic, like I was wrong, it, it would have incredible impact because he's got the audience. You know, if he were to say, you know what, I'm not going to speak to this issue because I'm not an expert on this. It would have this ripple effect throughout the, the, the country, really, because his critics wouldn't be able to come after him for that. And his followers would have heard something that he's unaccustomed to saying. So that's, that's the large scale conversation. But for many people, they're going to be uh, they're going to be most effective by trying to foster the relationships that they have and trying to not um, build up the echo chamber of people who only agree with their positions. And, and that's I, I guess my I guess my yeah, I understand what you're saying, right? I mean, you know, there's 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 the things that we as individuals can do, and then there's the the macro, you know, very large scale public, you know, either right. people or government or whatever. But there is an in-between in terms of organizations. <clears throat> so, so the political divide is not the only divide that we're trying to overcome these days, right? Racial divide is another big one. Right. So I, I guess the, 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 the question that's in my mind, and, and it is a question, literally, what can organizations, what can churches, for instance, do to help bridge some of these divides? So it's not an individual behavior situation, although, you know, that has to be in place or, you know, in, in development, too. But, you know, what, what uh, the big question that I'm trying to, you know, basically not solve is not the right word, but, you know, um, investigate, I guess is maybe a better word, is what can organizations like churches do? So churches can have difficult conversations <clears throat> and uh, can engage in those conversations with the congregation. And in every church, and I, and I don't mean to dive back to individualism, because I, I do believe there is a collective response that we can have. But in every church, there's going to be a tailor-made response because in different churches where I've had the privilege to serve as pastor, I've been able to have different conversations based on that congregation. Uh, I served in a church near Rocky Mount, North Carolina, and, and the culture of that church made it very difficult to have racial re conversations about racial reconciliation. One year on, uh, in February, or I guess January, near King, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Day, um, we, we had, I sort of structured a service around um, some of King's quotes and mentioned that alongside the, the gospel lesson. And um, after the service, a wonderful old lady who uh, is a committed follower of Christ um, came up to me and said, I prefer Billy Graham to Martin Luther King Jr. And, and I remember talking with another minister and saying, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. And, and, he, and, and he said, that's her way of saying, I'm uncomfortable with talking about King or race or anything like that. And, and the culture of that congregation was, it was a plantation church. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a... Um, a church back in the days of plantations, the, the pre-Civil War era, uh, the plantation owner would build a church, pay the minister, and every, anybody who lives around there, including the slaves, were welcome to come. Slaves usually had to sit up in a balcony or to the side or something, but the plantation owner called all the shots. Mm, wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, 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 and that church to this day is on the corner of a farm. So it's surrounded um, other than the street. And then across the street, that farm continues. So this church carries the weight of being a plantation church because the same family still owns the farm that goes back, you know, wow. a few hundred years. And wow. so to, to take to that family, hey, what you've built your reality on was antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't a message that they're going to be able to hear necessarily at that moment. And so um, 
we have to love those folks where they are as, as a church. That's a long walk to say to your question, at that church, baby steps would be the key. Being able to introduce spirituals, being able to introduce black and brown voices in a, to them, non-threatening way so that they can start to hear that as a legitimate gospel voice. Being able to um, introduce LGBTQ voices without it being something like saying, and next Sunday, we're going to raise a rainbow flag. Being able to introduce female voices in a way that says, that doesn't mean men are no longer men. You know, it just means that half the world population does have something to say, and God may be speaking through them too. It's, and so there are ways to have these conversations. It can't be condescending, but as, a, as an institution, every church is gonna be at a different place. So University Baptist, where I serve right now, um, is at a very different place than Hickory Baptist, which was the church I served in North Carolina. And so I, I think it was last year or year before, um, the, in Virginia, there's a, a group, I think it's called Inclusive Voices, and they will provide a, a speaker, a, a, a transgender person to come and talk about what it means to be transgender. And so during the summer when uh, many of the Bible study, Sunday morning Bible studies have taken a break and there are sort of optional one-offs that people will come to, we scheduled uh, this, this uh, uh, speaker to come, this wonderful woman who it turned out my wife and uh, her had known each other 20 years ago when they were both in the Navy, although my wife wouldn't have recognized her 20 years ago because uh, she had not transitioned yet then. But um, she came and just did an amazing job of talking about what it means to be a transgender person. And um, she's a, a committed person of faith. And so she was able to bring this conversation even as a person of faith. And since then, she's joined us in worship a number of times. But that was, a, that was where we as a congregation are. And it was a way to introduce and sort of continue this process of exploring and growing. Um, and so as a church, there are a number of ways, whether it's bringing in a speaker, taking some baby steps with where the church is, or even in hiring practices, making sure that when the church is hiring people, whether it's an additional associate minister, or it's an admin, that if there's a person, if it's a predominantly white church, if there's a person of color who's qualified and um, is available and interested, don't shy away. Too often white churches will sort of stay white. And, you know, that kind of intentionality begins to to plant the seeds for a paradigm shift and can be uh, productive steps toward being not just a more inclusive church, but a church that is growing in faith and growing in its walk with Christ. Hmm. It's a really great perspectives. I, I appreciate the thought with which you apply to these different situations. You know, it's, it's very nuanced, which, you know, is basically what you're saying it needs to be. Right, every situation is different. <laughs> we we miss nuance sometimes uh, <laughs> these days, and sadly, life is nuanced, and it, it it's so much easier to boil it down to a bumper sticker. And it, you know, if you can fit it on a pin, man, you're golden. You're, you're you're good to go. And but when your argument is like a paragraph, and the pin is like this big, it's like ah, your your slogan's just a little wordy. Sure, sure. Well, Matthew, I really uh, congratulate you on the launch of this book. And, you know, I hope it does do well. And I really hope that it does help a lot of uh, people and congregations. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see after the election, uh, what things look like, and, you know, what kind of healing can take place. I really appreciate you having me and giving me the opportunity to, to visit with you this afternoon and uh, look forward to seeing what the future be, uh, the future brings. You know, I want to leave with a, a message of hope, though, because even though I said the news can be stark and even frightening these days, 
as a person of faith, as a follower of Christ, I am a, an Easter person and I believe in the power of resurrection, even when it seems like, as uh, Beekner would say, the darkness is swallowing us. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, um, times of crisis are also times of opportunity. Absolutely. And so uh, I think we see opportunities on several fronts. Mm -hmm positive opportunities on several mm -hmm. fronts that were not as evident um, as, you know, they are now. So yeah. let's see if that's an opportunity that we can capture. <laughs> Amen. All right, Matthew, thank you again. Thank you, Ryan.